And with me for the duration of the show is my hand-picked panel. So excited to have entrepreneur, writer, economist, and very, very popular online broadcaster, Yaron Brook, all the way from the United States. Also a very good friend of the show, commentator and activist, Emily Hewitson, and political commentator and broadcaster, Jason Reed. Folks, great to have you on the show. Um, Jason, what do you think about those who have chosen not to be vaccinated? Are they bad people? They're not bad people. Well, there has to be space for disagreement when it comes to vaccines and sensible debate, but it's, it's pretty clear that that's not what Nicki Minaj was doing. What Nicki Minaj was doing was promoting her brand and promoting, uh, I'm sure her PR people were very, very pleased with the way it turned out. I think the worst possible response was uh, what Chris Whitty came up with, which is um, being very serious and, and not having any sense of humour about it. You might have seen that Nicki Minaj seemed delighted with that. She tweeted the clip of Chris Whitty uh, criticising her. She then tweeted a quite harrowing voice recording of her doing an impression of Boris Johnson. Um, this is, is not the way we should be confronting uh, things like Nicki Minaj's tweet, which potentially is dangerous if taken to extremes, but I don't think it would have been a very convincing case to many people to avoid the vaccine, and so I'm not sure it was really doing any harm. And so the response from the chief medical officer seems out of proportion and ill-judged. I mean, Jason, would you file that under a story that she's heard about a family member, or would you consider it misinformation? It's somewhere in between the two. I think it's a bit of Chinese whispers. It seems like one of these stories that's passed through a few people and has uh, become embellished and probably isn't very close to the truth of what happened. Um, a little bit entertainingly, quite a few people responded to her tweet by pointing out that uh, the particular symptoms that she described weren't necessarily to be linked to the COVID vaccine, but were much more likely to be linked to chlamydia. Um, so perhaps that's... Uh, more of Nicki Minaj should have done her own research as she uh, encourages people to do in the tweet into those symptoms before linking them to the vaccine. Emily, what do you think about the current climate in which those who have not had the vaccine are heavily criticised? Oh, without a doubt, it's a very toxic environment. And it's quite sad, really, because a lot of people that have chosen, um, made an informed choice not to get the vaccine at this stage are painted out to be these tin pot conspiracy theorists. And that's just simply not the case. I mean, um, there's been some discussions amongst my friendship group and a lot of the people that have chosen not to have the vaccine and have come to me and explained why. It's not because of any crazy reason. It's just that they don't feel comfortable at this stage. They feel that, you know, the vaccine is in its early stages and you know they just want to see it out before they make that choice and I think fair enough I mean I've had my first dose and I felt happy to do that I felt like it was my choice I didn't feel pressured to do that and that's great um, but I think it's very toxic and actually it has the opposite effect if we start painting out these anti-vaxxers as as demons because they're not all that's just not always the case. Yaron is uh, have the vaccine the new wear a mask uh, yes, I mean, it, it, it seems that way. Unfortunately, all of these things become politicized, right? I mean, the choice of a vaccine is a personal choice. I, for one, think that it's for some people, people over, let's say, the age of 50, it probably is irrational not to get vaccinated. They should be vaccinated. And there's absolutely no reason not to make a judgment about the fact that they're not. If you're young, healthy, I think it's completely optional. But the problem is that it's all become now politicized. There's a group of vaccinated versus a group of unvaccinated. In the United States, one tends to be Democratic, one tends to be Repub Republican, and it becomes completely an issue of politics rather than an issue of personal choice and health considerations. Why not treat individuals as rational people able to make their own choices? And if we're going to do choices, then I think businesses should have the choice. Businesses should have the choice to say, you know what? We only want vaccinated people. Fine. No, we want, we're willing to accept anybody. We want masks. We don't want masks. Let each business make its own choice. Stay out of it, government. The government has no business in telling us whether to get vaccinated or not, whether we can enter a store or not, whether you can enter my business or not. Leave that to the uh, business owners, to the consumers, to the customers. Let the market sort this out. Uh, Jason, do you think it is the human right of somebody that's not had the vaccine to then go to hospital and get ill with the virus? You know, is that something that is ultimately a sort of test case for our freedoms? 
No, it's not. There are, of course, medical exemptions. Um, but if you're able to get the vaccine, I don't think there's any real uh, reason why you shouldn't be doing that at this mm -hmm. point once it's been made available to you. I think it's very selfish indeed to be going around uh, not having the vaccine when it's free, it's easy. Um, and you don't know who you might be putting in danger by brushing shoulders with them. You don't know how vulnerable they might be to COVID if they get it. And so... Well, Jason, um, what do we know, though, about the transmissibility of the virus if you've had the vaccine? Because, you know, I, I mentioned in my monologue that it appears very helpful when it comes to uh, limiting hospitalizations and deaths. But in terms of transmissibility, it doesn't appear to be a game changer. Well, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I don't know the, the science of the transmission, but my understanding is that it does have some impact. And if that means that even one extra life is saved because we've encouraged as many people to be back vaccinated as we possibly can, I think that's worthwhile. And that doesn't mean we have to compromise our liberty through vaccine passports or whatever else. There are pl plenty of other ways we can do that. We've seen uh, in the US there have been schemes like lotteries um, for people getting vaccinated or even just something as simple as giving out a free pint if you encourage people to get vaccinated, things like that. Anything to help more vaccine doses get into more arms as quickly as possible, I think, is a good thing for everyone. Although the vaccine, Jason, itself is not without risk. I mean, any vaccine brings potential side effects. That's true. And that's why it's uh, so important to us. The government likes to say, follow the science. But that's when it becomes very difficult to follow the science because you then have disagreements between different scientists. And so I well, think well the Jason, there's no disagreement that the virus, perhaps for a tiny proportion of the population, uh, there's the vaccine, I should say, that, you know, it's clear that any vaccine, any any medical intervention will bring with it risks. And that's why, in the end, it's got to be personal choice if you have the jab, because it might be that if you have the jab, there are side effects. And it's important that you chose that for yourself. It wasn't mandated by the state or it wasn't pressurized upon you by an employer or a friendship group. Not being mandated by the state, I completely agree with you. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be mandated by, by a government force. But when it comes to social pressure, I think that the benefits of a little bit of uh, encouraging people socially to get the vaccine far outweigh the risks of, uh, of people getting it because there's, the science is very clear that when you look at a population of people, having as many people vaccinated as you possibly can is always a good thing. Yaron, you're nodding your head there to social pressure. Well, I agree. I think social pressure is voluntary. Yeah, social pressure, you can, you can ignore social pressure. I can say no, I won't do what my friends do. So as long as it's voluntary, it, you know, I think it's, it, I think it's fine. And, and I agree with Jason. Uh, having the population vaccinated is a huge advantage. Look, we've had hundreds of millions of vaccines delivered. Hundreds of millions. We're not talking about small sample sets. And the fact is the side effects for almost everybody are mild. Uh, the severe side effects are marginal at best. They're, they're minute. The, the, the probability that any particular individual is going to suffer from a really harsh side effect is basically well, we are, yeah, close to zero. The, the Daily, Daily Mail newspaper reported uh, claims from 30,000 women that they've had irregular periods and people have died from the vaccine. So, you know, you cannot say that it's 100 percent safe. It's nothing's 100 percent safe, but it's about as close as to safe as anything else that we administer in terms of medicine. And the benefits are the benefits are tremendous. Uh, I mean, look, uh, there's long, the, the, the long-term impacts of getting COVID to a small, tiny fraction of the population that gets COVID, the long-term uh, real harm. There's, there's risk of dying from COVID. There's risk of severe illness of COVID. So if you weigh all that in the balance, if you actually do the stats, if you actually look at the science, getting the vaccine makes all the sense in the world for almost everybody, certainly over a certain age. Now, again, if you're young and healthy and you're fit and you eat well and everything like that, I think it's optional. But anything over a certain age, it's, it's, it's irrational not to get the vaccine. It's, it's not consistent with the science. Emily, but again, let's keep the politics yeah, out of it. Yeah, I mean, Emily, uh, ultimately, closing thoughts on this. What motivated you to have the vaccine, given the fact that I guess you're in a lower risk group? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just decided that probably the risk of COVID slightly um, was higher than the vaccine, but that was my own choice. And I feel that, you know, these pressures, the threats of COVID vaccine passports could actually have the opposite effect. Mm. And um, I haven't got my second dose yet. And I do, I do kind of feel this pressure. Oh, if I want to enjoy a night out, I have to get this second jab. And I just don't think that's right in a free country like Britain. And I think it's also important just to point out quickly that almost nine out of 10 
um, of over 16 year olds in this country have already had the first jab and that's without these COVID vaccines or any kind of stupid lottery that there is. So, you know, Britain is doing a good job on the vaccine front. So there's really nothing to be hysterical about. Strong views coming in on email already. Oh dear, oh dear. Your guest, Jason, says that he's not a scientist, but he's happy to promote an experimental medicine. My choice not to take a mix and match booster at the same time as a flu shot, I do not think so. Where is the evidence the vax is long term safe? There is none. I am not irrational. Wear a smile. And that's from uh, Viva Libra. Uh, lots of opinions coming through. GB View. So big political news. Boris Johnson has urged his new cabinet to unite and deliver for the nation after carrying out a ruthless reshuffle of his top team. Demoted Justice Secretary Dominic Raab and his replacement as Foreign Secretary Liz Truss sat opposite the Prime Minister. And Mr Raab did not look happy. Take a look at this photo of him. Absolutely furious. What he's pining for is the all-inclusive buffet from his hotel <laughs> in Cyprus. He wishes he was there right now on a sun lounger. Well, Boris Johnson looked pretty happy with himself, making jokes as he gave an opening speech to ministers. They were all crowded around the cabinet table, not wearing masks. It's reported the prime minister will be hoping the reshuffle will provide his government with a boost. And could this new momentum signal a snap election? For now, the new cabinet have a lot to prove in their quest to deliver for Britain. And let's hope they do just that. But Emily, do you think that this rather uh, ruthless cabinet reshuffle performed by the Prime Minister, a man we were told wants to be liked and doesn't really enjoy sacking people, well, he's done just that. Is he on a war footing? Do you think an election is coming sooner than we might have anticipated? I do think so. I don't think Boris has any intention, and I'm not sure he ever did, of lasting the full term. I mean, it's been reported that allegedly he's not happy with the pay, um, much to the dismay no, he's, to, he's to, to Brit's working class population, <laughs> of course. He, literally, he can't afford to be Prime Minister. Oh, boo-hoo. <laughs> Come on, Boris. But yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it's really a big secret. Um, I think maybe Dominic Raab's uh, demotion was a sign of, you know, pushing his potential rivals uh, on mm. the back pedal potentially yeah. um it was great to see liz truss and um, uh, get a well-earned promotion i think she's been brilliant um in her role at the trade uh, department yeah. so i think that that was good news and hallelujah finally gavin williamson is gone i mean he's just had gaff after gaff it was a long time coming so i thought that one was you know a big woohoo thank goodness he's gone do you think the country needs an election in the next year to 18 months uh, the sun's political columnist trevor kavanagh told me three months ago that he anticipates a snap poll but what do you think i mean is is that what the country needs i think we all feel a bit like linda was it her, well, i think her name was linda from bristol uh, oh, brenda, brenda, brenda brenda oh sorry close, close. I know, and i'm gonna do a bobby daver and impersonate her she go goes, on what another one <laughs> another <was> one <laughs> but, but you might quite. be after bobby's job after that one um no but yeah I do, I do feel like everyone kind of has that feeling i don't think we particularly need one, especially as there's so much division right now between uh, lockdowners and anti-lockdowners and vaxxers and anti-vaxxers. I don't think we particularly need it, but, you know, what we want and what we get are two very different things. <laughs> That's been so, a theme of the pandemic. <laughs> brace yourself, Britain. I think another election is coming. I mean, this is all about politics, isn't it, Jason? Do you think perhaps the Prime Minister wants to have an election before... Keir Starmer has a chance to rebuild his party or perhaps before the big pandemic bill comes in? Quite possibly. It's hard to say. Boris Johnson has reportedly said that he wants to be prime minister for longer than Margaret Thatcher was, which is very ambitious. Um, and you can see why he would want to have an election. He'd want to get a mandate for himself because his first, uh, his first few years in office have been uh, dominated by Brexit, first of all, and then by COVID. The last election was won on the Get Brexit Done slogan. It wasn't really a pro-Boris Johnson mm. vote. It was a pro-Brexit vote. So you can see how he might want to say, I want Britain's endorsement for my vision. Um, but at the same time, from recent history, perhaps calling a snap election isn't the wisest. He doesn't want to do a Theresa May. I mean, he's got an 80-seat majority at the moment. And exactly. if he were to relinquish that, and, and provoke a hung parliament, he'd, he'd go from hero to zero, wouldn't he? Yeah, it's hard to see how he could be in much of a stronger position in terms of the parliamentary arithmetic, which is all up for grabs when it comes to an election. But uh, the repeal of the Fixed-Term Parliaments Act 
uh, wasn't very long ago, and so it's possible that that many people are predicting that that's been coming for a while, but it's possible that that was part of some longer-term plan that he's looking to ambush, or, ambush us all with. And what would be the advantage of, a, of an earlier-than-expected election? Well, I think it would be the start of this fresh slate. He would, he would portray it as the true start of the Boris Johnson uh, premiership, which the Conservative Party has been doing quite successfully for, for some time. It's quite amazing that we've had the Conservative government for so long, and uh, we still don't... Um, it doesn't feel like a Labour victory is around the corner. When we think back to David Cameron winning in 2010, that feels like a completely different party. And so he wants to do that all over again. He wants to reinvent himself, reinvent his government, and start from scratch with a fresh slate. Yaron, you must be puzzled by this. Coming this is all completely <laughs> bewildered. The United what, States. What are you guys talking about? When the Prime Minister <laughs> just clicks their fingers and says, let's have an election next month. I mean, a, a, a US president could only dream of such leverage. Well, yes and no, I, uh, but, but yes, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with it because uh, I, I grew up in Israel and the Israeli Prime Minister has that same power and yeah. uh, we just experienced, what, three elections in less than two years in Israel and yeah. didn't get much out of uh, any of those. So It's very unstable, isn't it, when you have that many elections? It's very unstable and, and look, it, it doesn't make any sense for Boris to do this before COVID is kind of over. Right. But you, don't, you can't do it in the middle of COVID. I think it makes sense if... If he comes out of it with a perception of triumph, mm. then you would imagine. But how any of us would let him get away with that is, is really the question. After all the yeah. lockdowns, the damage done, uh, the damage done economically, the damage done to mm. individual human life, I, I hope that the Brits won't let him get away with uh, announcing victory over, uh, over yeah. COVID. And, I, as a, as a I think victory. you're absolutely right. And, and if, if they were to sort of pencil in an election in the next 12 months, you'd be pretty sure that, that they felt the pandemic was over. I mean, if, if you, you know, imagine that yes. there was another yes. wave and, you know, clearly that wouldn't be a good look. But what does your knowledge of politics tell you about the idea of a second term? Because if Boris were to have an election in the next year to 18 months, that's his second term. Is it harder for politicians in their second term or is it easier? Well, in, uh, in, in American politics, when you're capped to two terms, uh, in a sense, it's harder because... You're a lame duck. You're a lame duck. And you're a lame duck from day one. And, and, uh, and the senators and that congressman are really vying for their own elections and they care less about you because you're not going to carry them on, the, on your, uh, your coattails. Yeah. I think in British politics, it's different because he could be prime minister longer than Margaret Thatcher. Well, he, he, could, he, he could, could have a third, fourth, fifth He could have fifth third, term. fourth and fifth term. So he's always Let that one striving. sink in, folks. <laughs> yes. 20, uh, 30 years of Boris but, Johnson. But then you can also think about the alternatives. Uh, you know, uh, b yeah. British politics is not exactly, we, we don't I have mean, any rising. In terms of US presidents, whether it's <laughs> Reagan, the, 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 the really, you know, the two-term presidents who made a yep. big mark on history, Ronald yep. Reagan, Obama, Clinton, um, was their first term better than their second term in, in, in speaking generally, would you say? Well, from what perspective? Uh, I, I'd I say know, economic, for... economic success, uh, war, so, their popularity. So, so Clinton, I mean, both Clinton and Obama were less damaging once uh, they lost majorities in the House and Senate. So once they became, once they had to deal with Republicans and they had to negotiate with Republicans, they became better, I think. Yeah. Um, it, when they had Democratic majorities, we got Obamacare, we got, uh, we got Dodd-Frank, we got a, a lot of bad things. When they had de uh, Republicans on the other side, same with Clinton. First two years, they tried to pass uh, uh, Hillary Care. People forget about Hillary Care. Uh, and then once Republicans were in the House after 1994, uh, he had to negotiate with Republicans. We got welfare reform, which is one of the better bills that have passed. Reagan... Yeah. Uh, Reagan, of course, I think lost it a little bit in his second term, lost some of that passion, lost some of the vigor that he had in his first term. So he was definitely better in his, uh, in his first term. But again, American politics is so different than yeah. the politics you deal with. Well, yes, and one term in the States is four years, and you pretty much start campaigning on, on day one of your presidency, whereas the term in Parliament is five years, isn't it, for a yeah. British Prime Minister, yeah. British yeah. government? Yeah. So that could be 2024, so... It's not happening. What, 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 it won't go to 2024. I, I don't think... I, I think if there is another snap election, which I think there will be, I don't think Boris actually wants to do it. I think he will either um, step down before the snap election or, more likely, do it after he's won the, the snap election. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I honestly do not think he wants... Even though so You don't think he level, likes to be Prime Minister? I, I, I actually don't, because oh. I, don't, I don't think he likes the paycheck. That's unusual. 
yeah, no, I, oh, I completely agree. And as someone that seemingly loves power, you know, he was London mayor before, I actually don't think that he... And also, he's not someone... He likes to be popular with the public. And as we come out of this pandemic, I imagine that his popularity could dip, especially if we don't have those usual well, so, conservative yeah. wins, like the strong... So, um, so maybe what he'd like to do is he'd like to say, I got Brexit done... I got the pandemic done. I won I an election, and then I'm out of here. Exactly before before we lose the you know the the classic conservative strong economy now values. It would, be, it would be unusual for politician to say I'm out of here when he's popular, when he could win, well, there, well, there when was... he could sustain for a while. You, David you're great, Cameron you're voluntarily great. said he'd st he wouldn't go for a third election, didn't he? It yes, sir. Uh, open ended. Um, stay in power isn't necessarily as good as Which it people, seems people to be. Which people people criticised because they said it sort of also rendered him sort of rather a lame duck once you announce yeah. retirement. And I think the same thing happened to Tony Blair, who said, "Oh, I'll do another two years or something, and then I'll quit." And yeah. at that point, it's like your your powers of patronage as, as leader suddenly disappear. People aren't afraid of you anymore. It's hard to predict these things. All kinds of different yeah. factors are in play. Yeah. David Cameron faced trouble in his second term, to use the lineage, whereas Theresa May faced it in her first. It's, it's hard to I say think if you want to be a powerful leader, you've got to pretend that you're going to be here forever. Uh, that's absolutely the case. I mean, the United States put in term limits because it appeared that FDR would win forever. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and they decided that there had to be a limit. And uh, but but he was so popular, and 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 you know he died in office, mm -hmm. and that's the only reason, uh, the only reason he left office. But it's interesting. I've heard this theory that you've raised, this idea, Emily, that the prime minister actually doesn't really enjoy being mm. prime minister. Mm. That that he likes winning elections, mm. and he likes to be the front man. But that, but that actually he hasn't necessarily got, you know, got the stomach for um, a long run. Although, you know, he, he is quoted as saying he wants to outlive Margaret Thatcher mm. politically. But who knows? But same was said about Trump. Some people speculated that Trump wasn't even intending to be president, that this was just a publicity stunt to run for the White House, and he accidentally won. Well, it's quite possible that early on, you know, nobody anticipated that he would win. Yeah. Nobody thought it was possible, and I don't think he did. And, and uh, sudden, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that even in 2016 uh, speculated that the night of the election he thought he was going to lose, that he, it was a surprise to himself yeah. that he actually won. But once he got in, it was very clear that uh, he, he liked it and, and he was going to uh, pursue it. And it suddenly looks like he's going to pursue 2024. Yeah. And at the rate Biden is going, I, I think almost anybody could beat him. Uh, and, uh, and it's certainly possible uh, that Trump could. I, I personally don't think that would be very good for America, but um, nobody asked for me. My opinion. Well, about we asked for your opinion. That's good. And I'm uh, but we're in Great Britain, not in America. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, you've been, you've been cancelled. Well, not here, not on my watch. Um, more from my panel very, very shortly. And, and Emily, can I ask for your prediction? Election date, when's it happening? Oh, that's a good question. I think next year... March. Wow. On a Thursday, as usual. March 20... I don't know, I can't... <laughs> What's the next year? I can't even well, so we're in 2021. 20... Gosh, Can I tell you, I I've got up. the same problem. Th Thursday in March. Can I tell you that the pandemic has destroyed my mental calendar? Honestly, I have no Half idea. Half the time, I don't know what day of the week it is. <laughs> I'm with you, I'm with you. But, but so you're giving us March... 2022. Which is next year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but that's, that's uh, like a few months away. Yeah, honestly, really? I wouldn't be surprised. Whoa! There's, there's, a reason, there's a reason this reshuffle has happened now. Yeah. And, and how about you, Jason? Your prediction? Yeah. I think mid-2023, just six months early, but just enough for him to feel that he's jump before he's being pushed if it comes yeah. to that. Yeah, if you go full term, you look like a hostage to fortune. I'm, 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 I'm with Jason. Then I'm going to do it before COVID is out. This so is completely not Early 2023, brilliant stuff. Well, how would you feel being called honey, darling, or sweetheart in the workplace? What do you think about that, Princess? <laughs> 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 Journalist Ella Whelan, good friend of the show, suggested employees should stand up for themselves rather than relying on human resources or tribunals. Mm -hmm. If a woman has language directed at her that she doesn't like, uh, then she should feel empowered enough to say, hang on a minute, my name's Ella, don't call me darling, or have a conversation with that person rather than running to HR. If we start instituting more and more regulatory policies in the workplace in order to protect wallflowers, that's a problem. For a tribunal ruled pet names are demeaning. A funeral home manager was fired after labelling young women at work terms such as sweet and chick. But what do you think, Jason? Have you ever had a nickname at work? 
Not that I know of, but I try to think now <laughs> behind my back what people. I mean, say. if I called you Jace or Reedy or the Reed Dog, <laughs> I've had Jace. The Reed I've Meister not had General. Reed Dog before. <laughs> You're welcome to call me the Reed Meister General any time, Mark. I'd feel honoured to have a nickname. What do you think about nicknames? Is, should it be a case of you don't go there in a professional setting? I think people make a lot of this issue. I think it's pretty clear when it's appropriate and when it's not. If you have a clear friendship with someone outside of work, then you obviously have that dynamic where you might have different names that you call each other, and that's fine. But if you're just someone's colleague, especially if you're a boss, um, it's pretty clear that you don't use uh, words that can be demeaning, like darling or sweetheart. Um, I think it becomes pretty telling when people are called up on this and if their response is, oh my goodness, I had, I had no intention of offending you, I'm so sorry, I won't do that again, then that's fair enough. If their response is, you're attacking my free speech, that kind of indicates that they didn't have pure motives to begin with. Yaron, I would say to any of these people, get over yourself. Yes, get over yourself, but look, if somebody is offended by it, then you should stop. And it, it shouldn't be an HR issue, it certainly shouldn't be a legal issue. It should be something that, you know, different companies have different cultures. There's certain cultures where you say sir to everybody. I mean, it's, it's you know, certain cultures you wear tight yeah. everywhere. And there's certain cultures that are a lot more relaxed and we should allow for that cultural very variety. And we should allow individuals to make individual choices and allow for communication. If I don't like the way you're treating me, stop it, please. And it's very revealing how people respond when they're confronted that way. Well, normally, Emily, if somebody gives you a nickname at work, it means they like you. Yes, I have two words written down here. The first one is grow and the second one is up. This is just... <laughs> oh, I thought it was a three, a pair. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. Um, no, I just think this, this is just so pathetic. I mean, Jason said that these words are, you know, can be interpreted as demeaning. If girl power is so strong, then surely you're not going to be offended by a word. But also, doesn't it cut both ways? I don't I mind mean, being my, called my, darling. My producer uh, that's on the show today, Bethany, we, we're calling her the queen. Mm, it's nice. Yeah, it's my nice. other colleague, Caroline, is hamster. Yep. It's quite cute. Yeah. And um, also, Cameron, who's joined the team, is bunny rabbit. But if Cameron came to you and said, you know, I don't, I don't like that name. Tell please him stop to grow up. Please stop calling. Would you tell her, grow up, Cameron? Or would you say, fine? No, I would say, I would say hop off, bunny rabbit. Like yeah, that. you probably wouldn't. <laughs> I probably wouldn't. <laughs> I, you I, by the way, I've been known as pork chop, and I, I knew for years in this industry that I'm just a piece of meat. It's now, it's now, now official. official. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I mean, another thing is banter. I mean, certainly in the military, in professional sport, uh, nicknames are a central part of the bonding process. They're part of the bond of trust, Jason. It, it's, and it's, sometimes the nicknames are incredibly harsh. It's, it differs depending on different situations. It's easy to say in the abstract, just grow up or just stand up for yourself, but you don't know what power dynamics are at play. You don't know what history might be there that might be going on in the background and make that more difficult. I think, I don't want to seem too much of a, a killjoy and too much of a, you know, death by chocolate is not a fully, fu funny name for putting. It's a real and genuine concern kind of thing. But, <laughs> um, but it, it's a, it can be a serious issue where if people are offended, um, we should be doing everything we can to make everyone's life more comfortable, to make people feel at ease when they're at work. And if that means not using words like darling, that seems like a small price to pay. Now, is it time to scrap council tax? Plans to ditch it with homeowners instead paying an annual levy worth 0.5% on the value of their home has been suggested by a Labour-leaning think tank. But the Institute for Public Policy Research, the IPPR, they say their plan has been blasted as a blunt tool with concerns it will punish poorer people living in areas of the country where houses are more expensive. For example, someone living in a house worth a million pounds will have to pay 5,000 pounds a year under the proposed system. But the think tank argues it's unfair that those who have benefited from soaring house prices in the south of England should pay so little compared to the value of their homes. So uh, what do we think about this? Jason, it's the hardy perennial, isn't it? Local taxation. What is the best solution? Well, council tax definitely does need reform or scrapping or something, whichever way you look at it, because it's based on property valuations that are out of date. Um, it's, it's clearly unfair. There's a campaign group called Fairer Share who have done a lot of research into this, which is worth looking at, because you've got cases where in the southeast, uh, multi-million pound townhouses and you actually pay less council tax on those than you do on a house in the Midlands or the North that's worth a fraction of the price. And so it does seem to be common sense, I think, to 
update the data that we're basing these payments on. And yes, that does mean that houses that are worth more, you'll have to pay more tax on them. But equally, houses that are worth less, they'll be paying less tax but than they are now. Yaron? I mean, I've never found a tax I like, so <laughs> if we can get rid of the council tax, go ahead and, and get rid of it. And you're an economist, of course. You've written many books about this. Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, a tax creates perverse incentives, and when you change taxes, you penalise some and some get rewarded. And the question is, is there justice in that? I would like to see it scrapped and, and have something uh, fairer and more uniform across the board. Uh, but generally, what this country needs exact opposite of what Boris Johnson is suggesting, is significantly lower taxes and a significantly smaller government. Do the Americans have local taxes? I mean, community yes. taxes? Well, well we have you, property we have? taxes. We have property taxes in the okay. United States. Every, right. every community or every little uh, county has its own uh, local taxes. Those taxes are primarily used to fund education. And, of course, as a consequence of that, uh, counties where the houses are worth more and where people are paying more taxes, there's more money for education. And uh, areas that are, that, that are poorer obviously have less money for education. So there's a, there's a, there has been a big push to eliminate that system and to spread the money around. But it never involves lowering taxes no, of course on not. anybody. It's always about increasing or redistributing. It's never about in, lowering. In, in your low-tax utopia, what, how, how would tax work, do you think? If you, if you ruled the world, would you have a flat rate? What would it be? Really? My utopia? Yeah. Uh, in my utopia, uh, taxes would be flat and voluntary. Voluntary? Ask for utopia. Yes, absolutely voluntary. Please uh, may I live in your utopia. I would also have a, a government that did only one thing, and that is protect individual rights. So we'd have a police, a military, and a judiciary, no NHS, sorry Brits, no governments run schools. I would like to see competition brought to healthcare. I'd like to see innovation brought to healthcare. I'd like to see the same brought to our crumbling, pathetic educational system. I'd like to see schools actually compete. So does that mean all schools would be private, all hospitals would be private? Absolutely. And, and what and happens if you're, you're a poor person, you get run over by a bus? What happens today if you're a poor person who gets run over by a bus? I pay for your health care. So in a system like that, you would actually have to ask me to pay for your health care. So you would use charity. There would be other mechanisms by which I would support that person. But you wouldn't be cursing me. You wouldn't be forcing me in advance to pay for your health care. And by the way, there was a question earlier about what would happen, what happens about somebody who's acts irresponsibly gets COVID, and the responsible people are paying for their health care. Now imagine a system in which you actually bore at least a portion of the cost of your actually health care. Maybe that would provide you with an incentive to get vaccinated or an incentive to behave responsibly not to get COVID because you know what? You bore some of the financial consequences. Well, some people do think that we'd be healthier if we knew that we had to pay for our health care because you'd think, well, look, I better look after myself, otherwise it will cost me. What Just the in the same way that you get your car serviced regularly because you don't want any big unexpected bills. Absolutely. One of the reasons, one of the reasons uh, we have things like sugar taxes and we, you know, as a government cares about the obesity crisis is because we all pay the health care bills for people who are irresponsible in some regard in their own diets, in their exercise, in the way they take care of themselves. But if people, if that cost was internalized, if people were actually responsible, at least for a portion of that cost, they'd still get insurance, but maybe their insurance would be more expensive because they were less healthy. Maybe that would provide an incentive for people to actually become healthier. Well, Emily, I suspect you're slightly sympathetic to Yaron's bold world vision there. <laughs> voluntary taxes. Well, I, I think I've got a very brave man on the right of me, actually, to come on TV. And this is one of the good things about GB News. We have people coming on, free speech, actually criticising the NHS, which seems a big, big no-no um, in this country. And that's he can't be cancelled because he's American. <laughs> exactly. Oh, oh, clever. clever. <laughs> um, but I think it is actually important to hear these ideas because so often we hear how great the NHS is. And I think many of the people that work in the NHS are great, um, but it sure. has become this kind of culture in this country where you can't dare say anything about the NHS Sacred without getting cow. 
absolutely hounded on. Mm. Um, so I think it is actually very important to bring these new ideas and to not have people shouting down at you, calling you evil, how dare you, and all of that hysteria. So I think this actually brings for a really interesting debate, and I'm glad that GB News allows for this. Well, we're so happy that you've contributed to it as well. You're a younger person. I don't know if it's none of my business if you have property or not, but what do you <laughs> of think? Of course I don't. What do you mean? I'm a young well, person I, in the I UK. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to <laughs> assume. I don't, I don't think many of people my age do, or if they do, they're very lucky, but mm. Boris keeps talking about building back better. What about just building some houses? Yes, that yes. would be nice. We need volume, don't we? <laughs> exactly. and, and, and so what, what do we think about the idea of council tax or mansion tax? Do you have a view? I think it's quite um, obvious that this is coming from a Labour-leaning think tank. I think there's certain ideas um, where, you know, they have a point, um, but in many ways, if you look, for example, the people that benefit, benefited mm. in the 1980s from the right to buy and now live in really affluent areas but aren't always on high incomes, yeah. I think this will disproportionately impact them. And I don't think that's particularly fair. But like Jason said, I think council tax is something that needs to be looked on as well. So, you know, I, I, mean, I welcome new ideas. The most unpopular tax in, in recent political history was the poll tax, mm. known as the community charge introduced by Margaret mm. Thatcher. They tried it in Scotland first, which didn't do great things for uh, Anglo-Scottish relations, I would say, possibly sowed the seeds of independence. <laughs> but uh, actually, there was something in principle quite fair about the poll tax, if you'd got it right, which is that everybody makes a contribution. Mm. So it's based on the number of people in a property, Jason. Yeah, this I is... mean, it'll never come back, don't get me wrong. <laughs> But political suicide. <laughs> but what, is, what does fairness mean in that context? What, is it, what does it mean? I mean, what do we actually owe in terms of paying into a system that locks us down, mm. uh, a system that provides mediocre or less than mediocre services, uh, a, a system that violates our rights on a regular basis? Do we really, you know, it, 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 what is the, the concept of fairness in that context? I want someone to empty my bins, though. Who's going to do that? Empty your bins. Yeah, that's what I paid my council tax for. And, and you, th you don't think you don't think that you could have a competitive market service that would empty your bins if you paid them for it? I would. Of course they would. I wouldn't trust the government to implement a system which allows for that kind of competition to do that properly. <laughs> you'd, you'd need a Bad. bin license, and you'd need all this. Well, that's the, that's the problem. It's the problem when the government has to issue licenses for these things. That's the challenge. Then if you talking. really let competition reign, you would get your bins cleaned like that. It would be well, so much more efficient. Margaret Thatcher introduced, introduced tendering within the NHS, which was continued by Tony Blair. And the idea was that, you know, you, you, you make certain services within the NHS more efficient. And uh, Tony Blair at the time argued, as did Margaret Thatcher, that you're saving the NHS money by bringing these sort of private tenders into it and you're actually getting a better service. But what's your thought on this? Do you like Yaron's idea of voluntary <laughs> tax? In fact, don't even email me with that one because quite clearly you do. But um, do you like the idea of a mansion tax? What is the answer? Should we scrap council tax? Is it fit for purpose? Uh, or indeed, should we bring back the poll tax? Nothing is off the table here on Tonight Live. GB Views at gbnews.uk. A new batch of emojis have been released. These, of course, are those funny little animated faces on your phone. And some have caused quite the debate. Unicode has officially signed off on a set of 37 new emojis for smartphones and devices in the next update. It includes one of particular contention, a pregnant man. Take a look at that. After facing backlash, Emojipedia explained how pregnancy or childbirth shouldn't be confined to just one gender because women have the ability to grow a child. The world's gone mad, folks. The organisation explained that the emoji won't only be used to signify childbirth. It could be used to denote that uncomfortable feeling after you've had a very big lunch. In addition to the pregnant man, we'll be getting an I'm melting face. The this is so scary or dramatic I can't look face. The OMG, you didn't just say that face. A saluting face, more realistic crying eyes. And are you sure you want to do that face? There will also be a biting lip emoji for all those sexually suggestive times. A troll, loads of variations in skin tones, hands, you name it. So many permutations. But I want to ask my panel how well they know their emojis. We're going to play a game called What the Emoji? 
Now, start with this one, folks. Jump in. What does that mean? Winky tug? Yeah, but what's the message? Oh, I'm um, like a bit cheeky. I mean, you're a little not on bit... catchphrase. I didn't uh, say uh, what you see. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't quite grasp the rules Sorry, of the so game. Winky, what is it? Winky um, tongue I think face? It's, it's a little bit suggestive. I mean, I put... Mixed with a bit of cheekiness, you know. Um... So it's cheeky. Uh, quite often when, when people have like made a joke, uh, they'll do that. Is that right? Like, I'm only kidding? Or maybe something a bit more like, I'm only kidding, but do you want to come round later? Brilliant. Well, my producer, Bethany, has said that's the right answer. Well done. So early points go to Emily. How about this next one? All right, what does that mean? Come on, Jason, you're down with the kids. This means when you've had a really fun, wholesome day at the swimming pool with your family. Um, <laughs> um. You've had quite a sheltered upbringing, haven't you, Jason? Yeah. Yaron, are you down with the emojis? You not at all. Do you I, use them in text? I, not at all. I like words. I like language. You like words. Well, look, that's uh, exactly right. I do think they've taken over slightly. Well, you'll have to put us out of our misery, Bethany. What does that water mean? There you go. So it's, uh, it's either sweat droplets, maybe you've been out jogging, or something called sexual fluids. <laughs> Whatever that means. Luckily, we're post-watershed. Uh, next up, what have we got next? Oh, OK, what does that mean? A pair of eyes looking a bit surprised. God, goodness me, the innuendos on this show. <laughs> in fact, who, who is in control of this? Is something on their sure, mind? I'm not even sure we do innuendos anymore. No. I, I mean, is that is that a kind of oh, I've been a bit naughty or something? Or? Yeah, I think I think they I think these three the trio of emojis, if used together, could only point to one thing. If you see where I'm going with this, right. um, but you know, in a more light-hearted way, if if you spy someone, you could do the eyes. Like if you see an MP in a pub, you could say just seen. So and so with the two eyes. So oh, I'm, try I'm just trying to stray away from from that certain topic here, and just trying <laughs> just trying to you know be a bit more family friendly. <laughs> I think that ship has passed, Emily. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, I, that that's certainly quite a good assessment there. Uh, I'm going to make you our official GB News emoji correspondent. Delighted. You've definitely, uh, you've definitely passed the test on that one. Here's the last one. Oh! And what does that mean? <laughs> I despair. Jason, is that, Jason, is that a personal favourite of yours? Um, well, I, you. I, I like aubergines in a lot of dishes. They're very nice. Uh, I can't think what you could possibly be talking about, Mark. Is, uh, there are lots of different vegetable emojis. There are carrots, there are potatoes. So this is perfectly wholesome once again. Well, uh, Yaron is giggling like a teenager, so I think he knows that that aubergine is a euphemism or a symbol of the male member, ladies and gentlemen. Who knew? I'm not sure who's member, but whoever they are, they're a lucky person. Here are some emoji sequences that spell out familiar brands and organisations. Uh, I'd love you to help uh, guess what they are. OK, so this is more like catchphrase now. Nice. So you've BBC. got... BBC. BBC is the right answer. Well Sorry. done. Sorry. <laughs> we get a bit excited by emojis. <laughs> <laughs> I need to take a chill pill. Is somebody going to explain to Emily there isn't a prize? Oh, you're <laughs> Emily, well, Emily's winning. There's no She's doubt. I've, 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 had, my, I've really had my eye on that Union Jack mug. I tell you what, <laughs> I think it's yours. OK, uh, let's rattle through a few more of these. Next up. OK, what have we got here? Jason. Uh, sun, sun, snow, sun, lightning, I don't know. What's the, is there one at the end? Is that a gap? Climate change. <laughs> it could climate be. Climate change, yeah. <laughs> this is, a, this <laughs> is a profound comment on the climate policy debate. Well, I can tell you it's weather spoons. Where's the spoon? I, can't see the spoon. I think the resolution on the image means we can't see a spoon, but it I is weather spoons. Um, have we got another one? OK, one more, last one. Right, what is that? Percy Pig. Well oh, done! Oh, there you oh, go. Dark Horse wow. candidate claiming the last few points of that Very game good. of what the emoji. Well done, Jason, Yaron and Emily. They will return after the break. Still with me, my fantastic panel, uh, Jason Reed, Yaron Brook and Emily Hewitson. Great to have them on board. More and more people are hurting themselves in London on the underground stations because they're afraid they could catch COVID by touching escalator handrails. Transport bosses say people are holding the handrails due to a perception they're not clean and are falling over as a result. Drunken revellers celebrating the end of lockdown are also said to be behind the spike in accidents. Transport for London says there were 12 serious injuries on the tube network between April and June. 
also on the buses as well. It's a complete disaster if I'm honest with you. Guys, what's your reaction to the idea that people are not touching handrails now because of fear of COVID and then they just fall down the escalator as a result? You know, probably catching more germs on the way down than they ever was on the handrail. Well, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, have we gone risk crazy? We're, we're risk crazy. Has, has our sort of balance of risk, you know, got sort of out of kilter? I think the media have a lot to answer for here with creating such a hysteria that people are so scared that some still to this day won't leave their house. Uh, so, yeah, I think the media has a lot to blame for this one. And I do think we've gone a bit germ mad. And remember, germs are good in small doses for the immune system and go. So well, don't be indeed. afraid to get a little bit dirty, you know? Yeah, what do you think, Jason? I mean, is, what's the world coming to that people won't touch a handrail? There are obviously always people who take it too far, but I'm, I'm not sure about this story. I mean, the time period they were comparing it with when they were judging the number of uh, people who fall down the stairs in, the, in tube stations was compared with last year when nobody was on the tube <laughs> because we were in lockdown. <laughs> so I think this might be a case of inferring causation where there really isn't any. Um, but, I mean, it's certainly true there's always going to be a faction of people who are a bit overly cautious when it comes to COVID. We've, we're all addicted now to this drip feed of daily stats with yes. the vaccination numbers and the case numbers and the death numbers. And it, it's unclear how we come out of that because none yes. of us have ever been through a pandemic in our lifetimes before. Well, that's right. I mean, is it time to sort of own fear again a little bit? Do you know what I mean? Because the behavioural scientists have sort of made us feel like the world is a dangerous place. And as you say, that we've got to full, put a full stop on this uh, and, and understand that life is dangerous. Yeah, it doesn't help that we've got all this talk now of potential winter lockdowns as well. There's going to be another spike and we're going to need booster jabs. I think booster jabs might be a good idea, but let's not stoke up fear alongside that as well. And, it's not really helping anyone. And COVID's not going away. COVID's with us. So yeah. we need to learn to live with it. Mm. Uh, we need to learn to protect ourselves in rational ways and, and get on with life. Uh, there are plenty of germs and diseases out there. You've got to actually live. That, that you know, being locked up at home, bad idea, not holding the handrail, if it's true, probably using statistics to lie. Nobody's ever done that before. No, never. No, never. <laughs> Let's talk about sperm. <laughs> A man has donated his seed so that his ex-wife and her new female partner can have a child together. So now Josh Rappahan from Tampa Bay in Florida. It's always Florida, isn't it? <laughs> has fathered children with his current wife, his ex-wife, and now, thanks to sperm donation, his ex-wife's partner, who's a woman. Are you keeping up? Uh, Josh Rappahan was married to Jennifer Vasquez for five years and had an 11-year-old son together. That was the straightforward bit. After they divorced, Josh married Danielle and had a five-year-old daughter. Jennifer got remarried to Chantelle, a lady who earlier this year gave birth to Josh's biological son. I'm exhausted just thinking about it. I need a lie down. Well, he certainly does. <laughs> so he agreed to be the sperm donor. It was all very above board. But what do we think? I mean, this is an extraordinary family, isn't it? But unconventional, Yaron. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure why this is making the news other than it's um, I mean, some unconventional. People, some people would but, think it's, it's immoral. Why? Because, I because... mean, you feel for the kids. It's like, who's my dad? Who's my mum? They all have the same dad. It's his sperm for all of them, right? Three different women. Uh, he didn't have as much fun with the third, I think. <laughs> Correct. Did creating the first two. But other than that, what's the story other than it's a curiosity? Yeah, I mean, definitely. <laughs> he, took, he took one for the team with that final baby, as uh, Yaron has pointed out, Jason. But would you not feel for the women involved that they're having to share this man? Well, you'd assume that they consented to it, wouldn't you? And it's mm. not some huge coincidence that he donated to a sperm bank. Is it one of those arrangements that people sign up to and then afterwards they start to regret it? Is it? What have we done? Well, I mean, there are four people involved. There's the bloke and the three women. They say that they're not a polyamorous, in a polyamorous relationship, but I'm, I have my suspicions about that. Perhaps we should get the human lie detector back to see yes. about that. <laughs> yeah, see how much <laughs> blinking this man does. Actually, yeah. I think blinking is the least of his worries. <laughs> <laughs> but, Emily... Well, I, Your I, reaction to this, I think, this Jeremy Kyle show scenario. <laughs> I think the only story from this is that maybe we finally understand what that Facebook relationship status that reads, it's complicated <laughs> oh, means. It's, <laughs> it's the very definition of it. OK, well, this is uncomplicated. Let's do this next. <laughs> 
Always a highlight of the show. It's time to reveal today's Greatest Britain and Union Jackass. So, Jason, let's start with your Greatest Britain. Who's caught your eye this week? My Greatest Britain is more of a pity one than a veneration one, but it's, it's Robert Buckland, the uh, former Secretary of State for yes. Justice, who was uh, sacked during the Cabinet reshuffle. It seems he was just sacked to make room for Dominic Raab to give him a job in the Cabinet. Um, nobody really expected Buckland to be sacked. He was widely seen as competent, but he wasn't the kind of backstabbing, media-hungry, careerist-type politician who rises to the top of the food chain. Yeah. Um, and he lost out as a result of that. And he said he's going to stay on as an MP and he's going to keep doing the best he can for his constituents. And I think he's behaved with with great dignity, and it's a real shame to see him go. I hope he'll be back in government before too long. Yes, I've heard really good things about him as a, a minister as well. Emily, your greatest Britain. Well, my greatest Britain is GB News's very own Esther McVeigh. Yes. Um, I, I think she's gone a bit under the radar by many with all the things going on, but she seems to be one of the few Conservative MPs that have actually stuck to some Conservative principles. She was one of only five Tory MPs that rebelled against their national insurance hike and she's also been anti-lockdown and pro-business and, you know, pro-economy. So, yeah, I think she needs a few more kudos and a few more pats on the back. So, shout out to you, Esther. My brilliant colleague, Esther McVeigh, who's back on GB News tomorrow morning, of course. Can't wait for that one. How about your greatest Britain? It could be anyone in the world, because you're a very global figure, Yaron. Yeah, I chose a Brit because, uh, you know, I travel a lot, so I travel into Britain quite a bit. So whoever it was in the British government, who decided to eliminate the PCR requirement yeah, yeah. Uh, is, uh, is a top well, of probably, my list. Uh, it, I it, guess it, probably it, Health Secretary Sajid Javid. Yes, who happens to be an Ayn Rand fan. And, of course, I am a, uh, I'm a, a you know, chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute. So, uh, there you go. So there you go. Small, maybe small maybe a little bit of that freedom um, inclinations uh, popped up. But I, I do like this um, Esther. The Esther. So it, 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 it sounds like uh, she's... Uh, She's one of the good guys. Uh, she, she certainly is, and a, and a big star here at GB News as well. How about your union jackass? It has to be Boris Johnson. What a week. He threatened with uh, uh, winter lockdowns. He has uh, announced that uh, we're going to see significant tax raises. Not voluntary, by the way. Compulsory tax raises. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, of course, um, he's always... Uh, bolstering the NSA, so, uh, so uh, the NSH, not NSA, that's, the a, that's a different, NHS, yes, different, different bad institution, <laughs> but um, the NHS, so uh, he has not been consistent with conservative principles or friendly towards uh, the people who actually make a living uh, in, in this country, so uh, well, shame on him. Many, many will agree with you on that one. Emily, your union jackass. Yeah, another that I think many will agree on. This week it's got to be the Met Police for their lovey-dovey approach with the absolute idiots that are insular Britain slash ER in disguise. Because whilst it's quite, you know, a funny story in many ways, oh, who ha ha the motorways were blocked, there's actually something much more sinister. I read a tweet that was quite sad, actually, that someone missed their cancer appointment because of these absolute inconsiderate, insensitive fools. Um, so the Met Police simply haven't done enough. It's a national embarrassment and it's a national scandal. Uh, oh, two right. Got to agree with you there. Finally, your union jackass, Jason. On a very similar theme to Emily's, not the police, but the group themselves, Into Lake Britain, the fruitcakes who have been gluing themselves to the M25 all week, at least with Extinction Rebellion, we understand roughly what they stand for and what they want. Insulate Britain, it doesn't make any sense. If you watch any of their media interviews with their spokespeople, they don't have a stance. They don't, they're not con contributing anything to the debate that's going to help us to fight against climate change and, of course, causing a huge amount of inconvenience in the process. I believe in the, in the right to protest, but um, the, the costs and the benefits of this one are very clear to see, I think.